Okay, you can turn your quizzes over and write your name on the front as well. Make sure you write your name on the back and the front. The official clock is when it gets to 10, uh, 11.03, 30. Quizzes over, so two more questions. <laughs>
We've about 10 minutes left.
Time is up. Please hand your quizzes in towards the end of each show. Please hand your quizzes in. Time is up. How was it? It was okay. Bring it, in, bring it in. Okay, you can leave it in my office. The door is open. Oh, okay, so you can leave it on my desk. Thank you. Okay. Richard and television. This one has no name. <laughs> I'll leave it on top then. I think you can do it. Okay, hey, folks, come say, get settled in. Okay, so here's what will happen. So, so here's what's gonna happen, folks. Flavia and um, Nofal are going to put together the quizzes in alphabetical order for me. So by 11.50, hopefully when I go back to my office, there'll be a stack waiting for me. And I'll probably start grading you know, around noon, but then I have to have a class at 1.30 and 3.30, but then I'll keep grading till I'm done. And there's one person who did not write their name on the quiz. So that one person will find out when they go to pick the quiz up. So nothing we can do about it right now. I'll grade the quiz, there'll be a score, and then it'll be free for all. So if you feel like it's a score you like, claim that it's you, and I can't disprove it. You know. So I will grade it, and after it's graded, I will put the solutions up on the web page for the class. Why after? Because if I put them up right now, you're going to freak out. You're going to look at it and say, oh my god, I got a zero on the quiz. So I will go on right after I put, so you will get an email from me saying, come and get them. The quizzes will be, they'll be face down, you know, in alphabetical order. That's why I asked you to write your name on the back. So if you didn't do that either, then I'll have to copy your name on the back. And so whatever it is, so it'll be in alphabetical order. 
just, so pick up your quiz, check it against the solution, and I promise you, I screw up all the time. I screw up. So if you see a mess up in the quiz in your favor, so I kind of understand that you're not going to come to me if I gave you too many points. No, I'm not that much of a believer in honesty. No, just come and talk to me. Don't, don't sit there stewing in your own juices, pissed off about the quiz. It's fixable. On the multiple choice questions, I know that some of you will have strong views about your answer. I'm willing to listen if you come with ammunition, which means you probably have to do three to six hours of research and say, I found some research backing up my answer. And if you're willing to spend six hours for half a point, I will probably give you the half a point, right? <laughs> so that's okay. I'm, I'm willing to listen. Now, I don't usually talk about the quiz, but I want to hit some high points or low points, depending on how you did on each part. Yeah. What's an effective board? Oh, let me ask you a different question. Can you have an independent board that's ineffective? Yeah. Yeah. Can you have an effective board that's not independent? Yeah. Effectiveness and independence are two separate issues. Independent just basically means I've created a board, there are no, I mean, they're independent of me. I could pick a bunch of 90 year olds, put them on my board, and I could just pick them randomly. And I'm, this is nothing against 90 year olds, but um, it'll probably mean that I can get by with a board of directors that never asked me a question because they have no idea what's going on. Okay. So you can have an independent board that's, ineff that's ineffective or an effective board that's independent. The third, the, parts, the third multiple choice question cuts to the heart of what an efficient market is. And think about this when you think about all the research on ESG or CSR. Or, you know. In an efficient market, should good companies deliver higher returns than bad companies? You're quick to say yes. What is the essence of efficiency? That the price reflects what you already know about a company. So if I take a good company and I reflect that in the price, what effectively is going to happen? You're going to pay a higher price for good companies, a lower price. You know what? The price will adjust to make your expected returns equate across companies. Otherwise, we'd all be rich. All we need to do is pick the companies that are good and well managed. And this is part of the reason. I just finished a paper in ESG I'll, I'll, you know, after I proofread it. I'm going to send it to you. This is going to open me up to all kinds of you're a troglodyte, you're a moral reprobate, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, I mean, remember what Winston Churchill once said that, you know, that never in the history of man have so many toiled and delivered so little? That kind of describes where ESG is right now, a concept that's incredibly overhyped, overmarketed. But you look below the surface, there's nothing there. So I'm going to use their own, and one of the things that they use to argue that ESG is good is what? If you're an investor and you buy ESG stocks, you will earn higher returns. Let me, so you know how lawyers concede arguments? I'll concede that to you. Let's say that's true, just, you know, and that's contestable. If that's true, it does say something about the market prices of companies that have good ESG, right? What does it say? that the market doesn't reward companies with good ESG because if they did and the ESG was priced in, your expected returns from investing in good ESG stocks should not be any. So if you're telling managers, if you're good, your stock price will go up, and you're telling investors, if you're good, your returns will go up, you're lying to one group or the other. Make up your mind as to which group you want to lie to at least. Don't try to sell it as all things to all people. The second question. Really, the question was about when I ask you for a cost of equity, what's the first thing you need to check? In what currency? Because that drives the risk-free rate. And then you look at where a company does business. So this is kind of a replication of almost every quiz. You've seen a variant of this. You know. And the reason I had to give you the T-bond rate is why? Because I didn't give you a default spread for each company, country, right? So you had to estimate a default spread, and one of the ways you can do it is to compare the dollar bond rate in that country, not the local bond rate, because you can't compare apples to oranges, to the T-bond rate. That difference is a default spread, then you're off to the races, because that becomes the basis for the risk premium. On the third problem, what is the question I was asking? I was asking you the Jeopardy question, right? Which is, it's a regression beta, what's in there? And the answer is whatever debt to equity ratio you had during the period of the regression. And then I said, look, the debt to equity ratio today is different. 
So you got to clean up for the existing debt and adjust for the new debt to equity ratio. And in the last question, it was really about doing this sequentially, right? Which is first you take the beta for the two businesses and you compute an unlevered beta for the company. Weighted by what? Value. I, I told you, if you have only revenues, desperation might drive you, but here I gave you a way of converting revenues to value. Exactly what we did for Disney, you take a weighted average, you get an unlevered beta for the company. And then you bring in the debt to equity ratio and you get the levered beta. I'll tell you about the best laid plans of mice and men. I love that expression. Okay. I always give two versions of the same quiz. What I mean by that is the quiz is exactly the same, but your neighbor never gets the same quiz you do. So the numbers are different, the multiple choice questions are, you know. Today, that plan was spoiled because at 10.08, I'm checking the two quizzes. They're already in stacks, already all in alternate order. And I realize on quiz B, there's a screw up on problem three. The names don't match. 10.08. There are two things I can do. I can let them go out and then announce to half the class to fix the quiz. And I did not even want to go there. So I. I took three copiers in the finance department, get, let them go at, at full speed. So you all ended up with only one quiz, and thank God for that, because if you copied from your neighbor, you're okay on this quiz. <laughs> Usually it's deadly. I get at least one person every semester who has a really difficult explaining job to do of how the hell did you get the perfect answers to the wrong quiz? <laughs> Okay? That is almost unexplainable. You get in front of the, that, that, that committee that doles out executions or whatever they do. No, this is impossible to explain. So now you know the secret. So on the next quiz, you will have two versions, so don't copy from your neighbor. I've given you advance notice. No. Final, finally, remember when we talked about risk, we talked about all the abstractions that drive risk? And I said, you will know risk when you feel it. No, I know you're living through troublesome times, but there's always something you can take out of it. Remember this moment, because there will be moments five, seven years in the future when people are back saying, what is risk again? Tell me. Don't stocks always go back up when they go down? Remember this moment, because this is why we demand risk premiums. Stocks don't win all of the time. They win most of the time, but there will be times like this. I mean, I taught this class in the fall of 2008, and you had a feel, I mean, it was like nailing jello to a wall. You got something nailed in, the next day you came in, the whole thing shifted on you. How many of you are doing oil companies? Anybody here doing oil companies? Thank God for that, right? <laughs> Imagine how the bottom has fallen out. All your financials have now become almost useless, because they reflect an oil price of 55 or $60 a barrel, and you're now at, what, $33 this morning, and God only knows where it's going to end up. When you started the game, what was the T-bond rate? 1.92%. What is it now? Th today, it's 0.4%. You think this is so difficult to deal with. It is why we do corporate finance in real time. So I know it feels like everything is coming apart at the seams, but for me, the coping mechanism is when everything is coming apart at the seams, I go back to basics. I mean, so I don't, I mean, it's not like I want, I, I have some crystal ball, but I know if I don't go back to basics, this is, so I, was, I got a call from CNBC this morning saying, can you come in at 10.30? And I said, definitely not, <laughs> okay? And I told them, look, I'm teaching, but I said, even if I were not teaching, I would not come on, because what the heck am I going to say? I know exactly what's going to happen to the coronavirus. Let me tell you what's going to happen over the next. Who, I mean, today, and I told them something that they did not take. I said, today, maybe you should consider going to silence on CNBC. <laughs> no, just put the markets up. Nobody talks. What are you going to say anyway, right? It's not like you're adding much to the discussion. Just let the markets talk. In fact, over the weekend, I was listening to markets talking, and they weren't talking, they were screaming. I basically took the three weeks between February 14th and March 6th. Now, how much value was lost, or market cap was lost over those three weeks? $7.4 trillion. 
7.4 trillion. 3.8 trillion of that was in the US because it is pretty much a big chunk of the global market. And then I broke it down by segments, worst affected, best affected. And you can probably guess the worst affected are. What are the worst affected industries? Uh, aviation, no. you, you got financial services up there because dropping rates are actually undercutting the mechanism for banks. So financial service companies in there. Life insurance was in there. Yeah. But among the best performing sectors, what do you think was in there? Grocery, retailing. People are stocking up like crazy for the Armageddon. Right? You go into grocery store, it's all it's not just the Purell that's gone. People are stocking up food like it's going to go out of style. I might not have food tomorrow. Okay. Tobacco. It's up there. Next time you hear about ESG, you're saying, I'm going to buy every sin stock I can, perhaps every addiction I can jump onto. Tobacco's up there. Biotech was up there, but not you know, traditional healthcare was affected badly, but biotech portion of healthcare. So take a look, it's actually on my blog, it's the very first post. I'm sure I'll get a lot of comments on it, and I mean quotes on the comments. You know, I didn't, I don't write it, for, I really didn't write for, I wrote it for myself because I felt unsettled on Friday evening. So I'm saying when you feel unsettled, and we're all feeling unsettled, go back to basics, don't go into denial. So if I close my eyes for the next three months, everything's going to go away. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. No. Don't go to denial. Don't go to rules of thumb. Don't outsource your thinking. Right? So read what I have to say, but then think about what you feel about it. Because I've, you know, I've created a mechanism there where you can bring in what you think will be the consequences. But there is an upside to living in unsettled times, is you will learn things that will you know, stand by you well during when times settle down. This, the moments of crisis, I mean, my valuation class says, go where it's darkest. Because that's where, you remember danger plus opportunity? You're seeing the danger side now, right? You can see why so, it's so difficult to even think about opportunity now, because what's the first reaction when you're in danger? panic mode, you want to just get away from it all. But there might be opportunities. Don't be crazy and put all your money in Carnival Cruise Lines. <laughs> That's not where the opportunity is, because there, be there might be never another cruise again, ever, right? I mean, this might be a death knell for an entire business, because you have a Petri dish. And you've learned what can happen if you put 60, 70, and 80-year-olds into a Petri dish and put them out in the ocean. This is not a good experiment to run. Sooner or later, something bad is going to happen. That's exactly what's happened. So with that distraction, let's get back to basics. We were talking about private companies. Remember the bookscape? I estimated a beta and a cost of equity for the private company. And then I left you with a question. And you kind of answer the question saying the cost of equity for a private company should be higher. But that's not enough, right? I have to figure out how much higher. So I'm going to take you through the process of how I would estimate the cost of equity for a private company. And even if you're not doing a private company for your project, remember your project? Eh? <laughs> Maybe some of these techniques might come into play. So what's my big problem with applying a beta to a private company? Beta measures only the portion of the risk that is market risk, right? And with a private company, you're exposed to all risk. Why? Because you're not diversified. So let's take the limiting case. Let's assume you're an investor who's completely undiversified, and you're focusing entire wealth in this one company. You're no longer thinking about just the portion of the risk that you cannot diversify, but you're thinking about the total risk. So here's a very simple way in which I can go from my beta to a total risk measure. Remember in the regression that we ran, we got an R squared. What did the R squared measure? It measured the proportion of the risk in a typical stock that comes from the market, right? So if I take you back a couple of pages, in a, in, I computed, I got all these, these are public companies, and with each company, I pulled up the R squared from the regression. It's a Bloomberg beta, I pulled the R squared. The average R squared, the median R squared across these companies was about 26%. So how would I read it? 26% of the variance in a typical book company comes from the market. The remaining 74% comes from the company. And what's the algebra here? If I am 
diversified, I care only about the 26%, the remaining 74% goes away. But you're not diversified, right? You're going to be exposed to all the risk. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the market beta that I got for this company, and I'm going to divide by the square root of, you're saying, why square root? It's a very simple statistical problem. 26% of the variance is explained by the R squared, but standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So I'm taking the square root of the R squared, which obviously is R, which is a correlation coefficient. You think, what exactly does that give me? I'll give you the intuition here. If you are a diversified investor investing in a book company, what you see in the risk will give you a beta of 0.86. You take all your money and you put it into one book company, you're exposed to all the risk, and that risk is going to be captured with a much higher beta because that beta captures all. I call this a total beta to capture the total risk. And I plug that beta in, I come up with, not surprisingly, a cost of equity of almost 12%. Do you remember what it was for a typical public company? It's about 7.5%. I'm giving them a call. So I said, OK. I remember the, the started with that lady saying, what's my hurdle rate? I called her and said, your cost of equity is about 12%. And then she asked me two questions, one of which was straightforward to answer, one of which I knew the answer to, but I could not figure out a kind way of delivering the answer. So here's the first question she asked. She said, a Barnes & Noble is opening. Remember, that, that was the start of the conversation. Publicly traded company opening down the block. What's their cost of equity? What's the answer to that? They're a publicly traded company. Marginal investors are diversified. The beta, the traditional beta fits, I said it's about 7.5%. And she asked me the second question. She said, if my cost of equity is 12% and their cost of equity is 7.5%, how the heck am I going to compete with them over time? You see the challenge? If you're a private company, you have a much higher cost of equity than a public company in the same space, not because you're more, not more efficiently run, it's because you're putting all your money in the companies. And what's the honest answer to that? You cannot in the long term. You know, go ahead. You could, but that's going to pull up your, so if you have a total beta 1.68 to start with, an unlevered beta, what is borrowing going to do to that? It's just going to make your, so if you're not undiversified and you go out and borrow money, the consequences for you are actually even greater than they would be for a publicly traded company where investors can say, what's the big deal if Carnival Cruise Lines goes bankrupt? You have to worry more. So leverage is not going to answer it. And over time, what's going to happen? Public companies are going to push out private businesses from the space. They go to head to head. You know what? It's happened already. 30 years ago, if you walked into a pharmacy in the United States, the owner of the pharmacy was usually behind the counter. Most pharmacies in the US were privately owned. Today, you walk into a pharmacy, you look up, what do you see? CVS, Duane Reed, publicly traded company. Publicly traded companies have pulled out private businesses. 30, 40 years ago, Almost every garbage disposal business in the US was privately owned. Over time, you got Browning Ferris, you got publicly traded companies that roll up private businesses and essentially become, so it's not even that they're more efficient, it's just rolling up private businesses, you become public, you've effectively, almost overnight, made yourself a less risky company. In business after business, private companies are going to get pushed out. And that's a depressing thought, right? Because we romanticize privately. Owned. I mean, Harry met Sally, remember? The, if you've never seen the movie, go see it, right? You want Harry and Sally to win, not the book chain. But Harry and Sally are fighting almost an unwinnable battle. If I'd written the movie ending, it'd probably have been different with the total beta coming into the picture. I don't think it would have done as well. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, just rent Harry, you know, go online. You know, it's, it's probably on Netflix or Amazon Prime. You know. But basically, it's the same story. It's a story of Bookscape. I'll leave you with a glimmer of hope. There are two ways private companies can deal with this. One is, if the owner actually builds up a side, you know, savings on the side that he invests in something else, or, you know, pension fund, you know. 
The second is that if you find a niche business that's too small for public companies to actually care about, right? What could that niche business be? Bookstores. You know, of course, Amazon's kind of killed all the bookstores, but within the, the physical bookstore, bookstore space, there still remain niche bookstores. There's a bookstore called the Mystery Bookstore. I think it's 27th or 28th Street. You walk into the bookstore, it's only mystery books, and the woman who owns the store has read every single book. Don't try this at Barnes & Noble and walk to the cashier and say, I like this book, what should I read instead? She's going to say, I have no idea, I've never read a book. Okay? <laughs> but if you go into this store and you say, I, I like Michael Connolly and I don't know, can you suggest some? She'll list out three or four other you know, writers, and you, you might like those books. She's found a niche and it's built on personal service. Community banks are actually a great example. Yesterday I got an email from somebody from a community bank saying, we know there's disruption coming to the business. How, what makes a community bank different is the fact that they have ties to the community and to the extent that they can use that niche to kind of make themselves critical to their customers. So one is for private companies to go into, but then you've got to accept the fact that you're going to stay smaller. You can't get over ambitious. The other is for the private company itself to diversify. Do you think that's going to take a lot of work and time? Absolutely. In fact, look at almost every family-run company in Latin America or Asia. They have usually go back 100 years. Look at what businesses they're in. They're in everything. Okay? You take the Tardis and Birlas in India. They're in every business. Why? Because for a long time they were a privately held company and the only way they could diversify was to go into more and more businesses, essentially creating the equivalent almost of a mutual fund effect. That takes a long time though. You can't do it overnight. But for many private companies in markets we didn't have public markets, that's how owners got more diversified. So when you look at your company, I want you to think about first whether a market beta fits. And to answer that, you've got to go back and ask, is the marginal investor in my company diversified? Remember I asked you to ask that question? If the answer is yes, just stick with the market beta. If the answer is no, you have a closely held company and you're convinced it's more like a private company than a public company, maybe you should start thinking about what the total beta should be. And if you go to my website, I actually have total betas by sector. Or you can do it yourself, just pull up the R squares with, uh, with the regression betas and see whether you can make this adjustment. Any questions on the cost of equity? Okay, let's talk about the rest of capital. Right? Everything we've said so far is about what does equity cost you. Let's talk about the cost of debt because after all, it is the other way you can raise capital. So I'm going to start off by asking a question. This is going to sound like an incredibly stupid question but humor me anyway. What is debt? You're saying, why would you go to the balance sheet and say what, if only I could trust accountants when they tell me what debt is. So here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the three criteria I look for to classify something as debt. Then I'm going to list items on the balance sheet and you tell me whether they pass the test. Here's the first one. With debt, you have a contractual commitment to make payments in the future. With equity, there's an expectation you will pay dividends, but if you don't pay dividends, it can't be sued. So you have a contractual commitment. The contractual commitment doesn't have, I mean, you could have floating rate debt, but it's still contractual. Second, that payment is usually tax deductible in much of the world. So that assumption might, I might accept some, some looseness on. And third, if you fail to make that commitment, bad things happen to you. Like what? Well, if you borrow from a money lender, maybe your knees get broken. But if you're a company, you get the equivalent of a kneecapping. If you don't make it, you go into default, you end up in Chapter 11. Fixed payment, tax deductible, loss of control. Maybe the, the lenders take over the firm. You ready? I'm going to list items off a balance sheet. And you tell me whether they pass these requirements to be called that. A bank loan. Obviously, right? How about a 10-year corporate bond? Yeah. What about a short-term bank loan? I've never understood why sometimes in investment banking you can't only long-term debt when you do cost of capital. There are people who do that and they say, what are you trying to tell me? If I borrow short-term, I don't have to pay it back? There is really no difference between short-term and long-term. All interest-bearing debt, there's no question it should be debt. So that was the easy one. What about accounts payable? 
you're not accounts payable, right? You buy stuff and you haven't paid the supplier back. It shows up as accounts payable. Should I count that as debt? For some companies, this could add a substantial amount to my debt. What criteria does it fare? I heard interest payments, I heard tax deductible. It's tax deductible, but it happens indirectly because it shows up in your cost of goods sold anyway, right, eventually. It's contractual that you have to pay it, but there is no explicit interest expense. Notice what I said, there's no explicit interest expense. If any of you run a business and a supplier supplies material to you, he usually makes you an offer. You can either pay right away, you can pay in 60 days, but he's not stupid. To sweeten the pot, what does he say? If you pay right away, you get a 2% discount. You know what that 2% discount is? It's the interest rate you're paying on accounts payable. So if you want to count accounts payable as debt, I can go along if you're willing to go into your cost of goods sold and make that implicit interest expense explicit. I often get emails from people saying, can I count accounts payable in debt? I said, yes, if you're willing to go into the cost of goods sold, and tell me how much of those costs of goods sold were lost discounts. Three hours later, I get an email that says, I've changed my mind. <laughs> because you try it, you basically give up, right? How do you tell? You can't tell from the cost of goods sold. So accounts payable and supplier credit are not debt, but be very clear on why they're not treated as debt. It's not because they're not contractual obligations or that they're not tax deductible, is they have no explicit interest expense. What about underfunded pension obligations because increasingly in the US, you're required to show that on your balance sheet, right? So if you are a legacy company like GM, you made fixed pension promises to your employees that shows up as a liability. And if your assets are not enough to cover that, you have to show an underfunded. And it can be huge, tens of billions of dollars from some old companies. Should I treat that as debt? Here's where you shouldn't listen to the accounting side of you, which is general, a good idea. Whenever the accounting side of you, you know, say something, just shut it down. Because what's a conservative part of you saying? Well, I should count it as debt. That's a conservative thing to do. You know what's going to happen if you start counting everything as debt? Your debt will balloon out. Your cost of capital will actually decrease. Fight the urge to start loading up your debt with everything you see on the balance sheet. Stop with interest-bearing debt. Let the rest rest for the moment. You can deal with it later. But if only you could stop there. Can you think of other items that are off the balance sheet that, that you could think of as debt? That meet these requirements, contractual commitments, tax deductible, loss of control? In 2019, accounting finally came to its senses on leases. Because until 2019, if you're a retailer, you signed a 12-year lease agreement, you know what accounting allows you to do? It essentially said you don't own the property, there is no ownership no requirement. Therefore, we will treat it as an operating expense, we won't treat it as debt. The biggest source of off-balance sheet debt in the world was leases until last year. It's starting to change, so that's, a good, that's good news. But I'll talk about how to convert leases to debt so you can see what accountants are doing this year. But to convert leases to debt, I have to answer another question. What's the cost of debt? We talked about the cost of equity, right? Risk-free rate, beta, risk premium. What's the cost of debt? And I'm going to make a statement about how the cost of debt should be computed in the cost of capital. That's going to guide how I compute the cost of debt. The cost of debt is the rate at which I can borrow money, I being the company, can borrow money long-term today. Two key words there, long-term and today. You know why I threw the first one there? To the extent that in any healthy market, you have an upward sloping term structure. You know what that is, short-term rates are lower than long-term rates. If I let companies tell me what their cost of debt is based on the borrowing they have, you know what they're going to do. They're going to replace all their long-term debt with short-term debt and say, hey, look, my cost of debt went down. And that's a very dangerous game to play if you're a company. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, play whatever games you want on the term structure, but I'm going to act like all your debt is long term because you got to roll over that short term debt. So I'm going to give it, it actually makes my life easy. I'm not going down with all this parsing of the debt. I'm taking all interest bearing debt, short term and long term, and attaching a long term. You're saying, what's it today doing there? If I ask you what a cost of debt is, don't bring out a bank loan you took last year, two years ago, three years. Look, my daughter, this is what my cost of debt used to be. It's the cost of debt today. 
You know what that's going to be driven by? The risk-free rate today. Plus a default spread reflecting the fact that you're not risk-free. And that becomes the core of estimating a cost of debt, is computing that default spread. So we'll start easy and then we'll make life difficult. If you have a company that has long-term bonds outstanding, that traded in the market, you get a very quick glimpse at least of what the cost of debt is, right? There's an interest rate on the bond, and to the extent that that interest rate covers all of the things investors worry about in your company, including default risk, you can take that rate as your cost of debt. I almost never do this, and here's why. Let me ask you a question. Can a risky company issue a safe bond? Yes. By doing what? What do they have to do? They have to take their safest assets, collateralize it, and issue bonds against it. So if I take one bond issued by a company, I take the rate on that bond and make it the cost of debt for the whole company, I'm going to underestimate the cost of debt. But if, you're, if you have bonds outstanding, what else should I be able to find for you as a company? I can usually find a bond rating. Now we're entering into some dangerous ground here because we're trusting. No? But no, before you say that's all biased, it's all nonsense, I mean, if you look at the history of bond ratings, they're very good predictors of default risk. So while we might pick on the exception, you missed that one, 99% of the time they get it. They might be off, they might be delayed. But there's a bond rating, and you're saying, if I have a bond rating, what do I do with it? I can estimate a default spread for you based on that bond rating. So you're a triple B rated bond. At least on January 1st, 2020, you are paying about 2% more than the risk free rate. Today, you're paying about 3.5%. Why? Because people are more scared. The same forces that push up your risk premium are going to push up your default spread. So I'm going to take that default spread added to my risk free rate. I've got a cost of debt. That's my easy scenario. But what if my company does not have a rating? 90% of companies globally, especially if you go outside the US, the default is your company probably doesn't have a bond rating. There are two things you can do. One is you can look for an easy way out. If this company borrowed money yesterday, and you know what the interest rate on that borrowing was in its long term, you can say, you know, you can close your eyes, hope for the best, take that rate and say, I hope that's a cost of debt. But as we pointed, I can borrow money against my safest assets. So I'm going to suggest another way. And this is something that, you know, I'll take you through the process of how I came up with this approach. But essentially, I'm going to act like a ratings agency and give you a rating. You say, how are you going to do that? Ratings agencies are the most transparent organizations in the world. You know why? Because they give you two things. One is they give you the rating for every company that they rate. And then they give you the ratios. They don't need to tell me a thing about what happens inside the company for me to back out exactly how they do things. So 25 years ago when I started thinking about being a ratings agency, I said, you know what, let me download the rating for every company. So I had an Excel spreadsheet, the rating for every company. Then S&P gave the seven ratios they claimed to use in coming up. They've given away the game, if you ask me. So I put the seven ratios in that same Excel spreadsheet. So here's what I have, rating in the first column, seven ratios in the next. Then I did some reverse engineering. You know what I mean by reverse engineering? I, backed, I looked at the AAA and the AA to see if I could start to guess what the rating was based on the ratios. And here's what I found. I found that for non-financial service companies, financial service companies are an entirely different beast. Non-financial service companies, out of the seven ratios, one did the heavy lifting and the other six went along for the ride. The ratio that best explained differences in ratings across companies. So think of doing a correlation between the two was the interest coverage ratio. Remember from accounting what the interest coverage ratio is? It's a basically the interest expense divided by, I'm sorry, the operating income divided by the interest expense. I'm going to use that interest coverage ratio with a lookup table to come up with the cost of debt for every company. So let me start with my easy companies. For three of my companies, I was able to find an S&P rating. So I trusted the rating. I took the default spread based on that rating. Notice an A minus company has a higher default spread. Added that to my risk free rate. So I'm staying currency consistent and came up with the cost of debt for those companies. And again, if I wanted to convert Vale's cost of debt from dollars to reais, we know how to do it, right? Take the inflation difference, and I can come up with the cost of debt in any other currency. So if your company is a rating, you're already home free. You're done. 
If your company doesn't have a rating, then here's what you need to do. First compute and interest coverage ratio. To do this, what do you need? You need operating income. You're saying, what if my operating income is a loss? You disobeyed my instructions, right, of picking a company that's making money. So, you know, at this stage, I'm going to let you stew in your own problem. Now, actually, I will give you ways to deal with it. But now, do you see why I begged you? I beseeched you, don't pick a money-losing company. You're just going to have to deal with problems. But the reality is, if you're not doing a company for a project, there are companies out there that are money-losing companies. We have to do this. So I'll, you know, we'll talk about what to do with those companies. But basically, what you're doing is you're taking your operating income, dividing by the interest expense. Think like a lender. Do you want that number to be a high number or a low number? You want that number to be a high number, because if you're lending to a company, you want a lot of buffer. So if I can somehow convert the rating into a, ra into a, a ratio into a rating, I'm going to be able to come up with what I call a synthetic rating, basically a fancy word saying, I'm making up the rating, don't blame Moody's or s and P for it. So I took my five companies, even the companies that had a rating, because I wanted to see how close I could get to the rating, I computed the interest coverage ratio for each of these companies. So if you look at the interest coverage ratio, the safest company here on pure interest coverage ratio is Baidu because it hardly has any debt. And right behind it was Disney. So if I can somehow take these ratings and con ratios and convert them into ratings, I'm going to be home free. So here's what I have. I have a lookup table that I update at the start of every year. This lookup table came from an original assessment of ratings and ratios. At the end of that analysis, I built a lookup table to say, if you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is, I'll guess what your rating is. And I noticed then that large companies seem to be rated more favorably than small companies. Don't ask me why. If you're too large to fail, you can always have more access to capital. So I created a lookup table based on your market cap as a company. And my cutoff for large was pretty high. It's $5 billion market cap or higher is large or low. So if you're a large company, I'm going to use the first column. If you're a small company, I'm going to use the second column. So let's start with Disney. Large cap, developed market company. I went to the first column, 22.57. It's no contest. They're AAA. They're way above the highest number there. Vale, large cap, emerging market. All emerging market companies are put into the second column because even if you're a large cap emerging market company, again, it's two sets of rules that ratings agencies. I'm trying to replicate what ratings agencies do with just one ratio. So I use the emerging market, 11.67, so that puts them right there, 9.5 to 12.5, we gave them a double A rating. Tata Motors, large cap emerging, 4.51, I'm now getting down, they barely make the cut, but 4.51 puts me at A minus for the company. For Baidu, small cap emerging market, 23.72, you're saying Baidu, triple A rating, no way. Remember, I'm gonna attach this cost of debt to how much debt they have, and what did I just say about Baidu? They don't have much debt. Don't waste your time on refining the cost of debt. If a company has 3% debt and 97% equity, who really cares? Just give them a cost of debt and move on. Because you don't want to end up getting caught in a number when it's not going to affect your cost of capital. And finally, for Bookscape, it's not even a public company. But remember, lenders to private companies also think about interest coverage ratios, right? Because they need to get their interest expenses back. 5.16, I gave them a rating of A minus at the ratings for all five companies, at least a synthetic rating. I compared those synthetic ratings with the actual ratings. I wanted to see how close I was getting. And if I wasn't getting close, I wanted to see what was going on. So let's take Disney. My rating was AAA. My synthetic rating was AAA. Their actual rating is single A. You think, what's going on? Well, the ratings agencies are doing something very sensible. I'm basing my interest coverage ratio on last year's operating income for Disney, which happened to be a really good year. And if you're a ratings agency, often you look across time, you look across in, movie revenues can go up or down. One way to deal, do with, do, deal with this in a synthetic rating is look at your average interest coverage ratio across time, rather than just look at last year. So, that makes sense. The AAA probably is too high for Disney, given how volatile their income is. So I said, OK. For Vale, my synthetic rating was AA, but their actual rating was A minus. That's a pretty big difference. You're saying, what's happening here? Well, Vale is a Brazilian company. You're saying, who cares? Ratings agencies factor in where in the world you're incorporated. And it's not fair, but for a long time, ratings, ratings agencies used to have what was called a sovereign, I mean, you're a country ceiling for companies, which meant that no company in a country was allowed to have a rating higher than the country itself. 
Can you imagine being a company in Venezuela? You're already doomed, right? Because your rating is already cut at what? D, C minus, whatever it is right now. Ratings agencies have relaxed at constraint, but still it shows up in the rating. So that difference is the Brazil difference. And Deutsche Bank, I can't even compute a synthetic rating. So I said, you know what? I have no idea what's going on here. And after all, for a bank, debt is really not a source of capital. It's raw material, so I'm going to move on. For the companies where I was able to get a synthetic rating and only that for Bookscape, I used a synthetic rating to get a default spread. I added that to my risk-free rate to come up with the cost of debt. And one of the things about the cost of about debt is that it, there is this tax advantage built into the system. In what way? Interest is tax deductible in much of the world, which means when I pay a 5% interest rate and I have a 40% tax rate, I'm effectively paying only 3%. So I multiply whatever the cost of debt is by a 1 minus tax rate. And I use the marginal tax rate of the country that you're in, even though your effective tax rate might be much lower because interest saves you taxes on your last dollar of income. So let's, let's summarize. You have to get a cost of debt for a company. If you, actually have a, if you can find a bond rating for your company, take the rating, come up with the default spread, look at the marginal tax rate for the country. In fact, if you go to my website, I have marginal tax rates by country. I wish I could claim credit for doing the work and putting this together, but KPMG did it and I stole it from them. I give them credits. I said this comes from KPMG, but basically it lists out for 180 countries, whatever the marginal tax rate is. Okay? Take that and multiply. If your company does not have a rating, then compute an interest coverage ratio, do the lookup, come up with a synthetic rating, do the same thing. At the end of the process, you're going to end up with a cost of debt for your company. So what we're going to do when we come back on Wednesday, which is, uh, incidentally, too, uh, I forgot to mention, I just, there's no rest for the wicked. I just put up the case online. So you, I'll also send it out as a link saying what case, you know, it was there from the beginning, trust me, I have not thrust it on you suddenly. You have, it's April 1st, I think it's due, it's well after the break, but I would suggest reading it at least before the break. Okay? It's a group project, so, you know, you get information on that. Professor, um, on the project, um, I so obviously for the operating leases they changed the accounting standard. 
So do we still need to go back and reverse that? We can check to see if the number is close. If you have been doing it this close to what they're doing, you just come up so you should, to the same number. I was having trouble finding, though, what the expense was for the current year to back that out. It should for whatever be reason. Yeah, so that, I don't know. In order to take expense for the most recent it might say rent from the most recent year was. Yeah, it gave us, it gave me some stats for last year, but I, I'll go back and take a look. I might have missed it. Last year is the most recent year. Uh, the year before that, eight. Oh yeah, eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah, yeah. I guess so I'm wrong. Right. Yeah. And then because you're in the 2019 yeah. annual report. Nineteen. 2019 annual report. Yeah. So then they should give you the number for 2019. Last year. Yeah. I'll go back and check. I was having trouble finding. It. Anyway, and then for the part on cost of equity, we're talking about private companies, and they should have a you know higher cost of equity because you know the marginal investors and. Uh, it's not good. But. If you're going to sell the company... What about, like, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, who owns the majority of his company? He's not diversified, per se. Yes. So his costs of equity for his company... But no, actually, who set the price of Facebook? It's not Mark Zuckerberg. That's the real thing. Well, you don't need to... So, so it's dictated by the... Can also, you can be all Mary Ellis for, for, for 20 years now. He's owned 26% of all of it. Mm -hmm. But the price of Oracle is not set by Larry Ellison, it's set by investors trading on it. So in a sense, if you're Larry Ellison or Mark Zuckerberg, you might own a big chunk of the company, but your market value is I going to be driven by what margin and investors take. I see from an evaluation perspective, because if but you, you want to use them... But you have perspective. You've got to take decisions that keep your margin investors happy, because they're not happy. But you are the investor. In 